Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Julie Swan. This is our first alumni event that is virtual. I'm delighted that we are kicking it off with a virtual reunion of our FMM program. Uh, and here with me today, I also have a couple of people from NC State, including uh, staff Mike Walsh and Rob Lassen. I've got two students here, England and Meredith. And I've got a number of alumni, and you're going to hear from two of the alumni in the furniture industry about what they've been doing. Today is May 15th, although you may be watching this uh, virtually uh, at a different time. And we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so that will, uh, you know, we'll touch on that a little bit here and there as we, as we go forward. So uh, just a brief agenda, we'll talk a little bit about what's been going on in the department and the university. Uh, and actually, I'm going to switch the order and have the students go uh, first and then the alumni. Uh, and I also have Meredith uh, joining and, and her, her name will be on a later slide. And then we'll have social time and we can share stories about what else might be going on. As you probably have seen, the university moved very quickly in early to mid-March to take action when the university leadership realized that the COVID pandemic was going to be significant. Um, one really good thing is that uh, the university was able to move before spring break and we had a number of students who were traveling, students and faculty and staff who were traveling during that time period, but we were able to make sure that we didn't um, bring back uh, the COVID-19 disease and, and blow up the infections in the, in the Raleigh area. Um, we went, we transitioned to online classes for the spring. It was really extraordinary. In about two weeks, every single faculty in ISC and the College of Engineering moved their class online in two weeks. I mean, really, and this was happening nationwide, of course, but I cannot tell you how grateful I am to the faculty and staff who made that happen and to the students who persevered during that process because you know it has not always been an easy transition uh, the, the students can tell you and um, you know everybody was figuring this out together and many of our faculty and staff may have had uh, children at the house who were out of school and so they had to figure out how to deliver their lectures in, in that kind of environment. The university has announced that we will also have our summer classes in an online format to give us more time to prepare, um, but that we're intending on having uh, students back on campus in the fall and plans are underway right now for how to do that in a way that is safe for the students, the faculty and staff, as well as the surrounding areas around NC State. When the governor lifted his, uh, his full statewide order and, and we moved to, to phase one, we also initiated the process to open up uh, limited amounts of research on campus. So, so that will open up next week with uh, a number of different safety pro protocols in place. Now, during all of this, even though the campus has been closed for some operations, in fact, we've continued all of our ongoing operations. The university is not closed for business. It's just that we're not doing all of that business from on campus. So we have continued with our educational programs, continued in research, continued in service, and we are also figuring out ways to continuing, uh, uh, continuously engage with alumni. And so thank you for, uh, for your patience and, and working with us uh, on that process. Some, some more example activities. We've had a number of faculty doing things specific to COVID. We've got a group who has a rapid proposal to look at hospital surge operations, which are critical when uh, disease outbreaks really increase the demand on the hospital system. Um, we also have another group that has recently received word that they have a center related to manufacturing. Uh, the overall initiative for the whole nation is, is part of the SESME initiative, and then they have the particular center name here on campus will be SMIC, S-M-I-C. And we do have the research lab starting up next week with limited operations. Uh, we have some other activities that might be of interest for alumni or, or friends of the university. So one of these is that next week we're having a virtual panel that's organized by the College of Engineering that will talk about different kinds of activities in different departments. In addition to that, we will have a webinar coming out from ISC the week after that on Friday, May 29th, 
where we'll tell you a little bit for those who are interested, we'll talk about disease modeling and, and what we think will happen in the coming weeks and months with COVID and, and how to interpret some of the data and news reports that you see. We've also given us a, a webinar related to supply chain continuity and how to think about that type of continuity in the face of major disasters. And, and that's available already on YouTube if you're interested. Our faculty have also been engaging with media and writing opinion pieces to try to make sure that NC State is at the forefront of, uh, you know, that motto of think and do and, and that people are turning to NC State experts. So that's been really great across the whole university, a number of experts. Our manufacturing lab also scaled up production of products to assist with uh, local hospitals and healthcare workers. In particular, one of the things that they've been doing is developing a shield to use around masks. And on the far left, you can see what a mask might look like um, with the shield. So basically it's to help make a better seal on the face. So this could be used with a KN95 mask, which has a different standard than an N95 mask. And uh, you know they're manufacturing the the, the plastic parts, uh, if you will, so that it can fit more tightly and be comfortable for the healthcare workers. And they've made uh, other things as well. You can see one is called an ear saver. I think that that's pictured in the the bottom right hand corner. And they've distributed products like these to a, a number of different organizations around the Raleigh area uh, who had contacted for assistance. And it's not only the ISE department and our manufacturing labs, there are operations ongoing out of the mechanical and aerospace department. Uh, the textiles uh, college is producing non-woven material. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, everyone is trying to do what they can to assist in the response. So I'd like to turn to England and, and then Meredith, just to give a brief update on what things have been like from a student standpoint. England? Oh, England, you're on mute. And while you're getting off mute, I'll just remind everyone else as you join us today, mute, and then we'll come back and let everybody share at the end. England. Okay, yes. Yeah, so ending my uh, time at NC State has been really interesting, um, especially like this last semester with senior design and the pandemic going on, we had to abruptly stop going to our, our on-site facility for our senior design. So that changed our ability to like collect data and communicate with the staff and everything. And so it has definitely been an adjustment, kind of getting used to the new setup. But um, in terms of like my future plans and just moving along from NC State, I'll be joining FM Global as a consultant engineer. So I'll be moving to California um, in July. So it's a pretty <laughs> quick turnaround and a major um, adjustment very quickly. But if everything goes as planned, I'll be uh, moving there. In my interview for that, I didn't get a chance to go on site. I had to do it virtually because it kind of happened when everything was started going on. So I haven't really seen what, where I'll be working at or anything like that. So when I get there, it'll be definitely um, time for me to adapt and, you know, just keep pushing. <laughs> Thanks, England. We appreciate that. And, and we'll make sure now we know who to contact when we go out to California, right? <laughs> Yes, for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Meredith, can you give a bit of an update? Come off mute for me. We can't hear you. Is that better? Yes, that works. Can Thank you, you hear Meredith. Me now? Okay, perfect. So I am Meredith. I guess I can officially say I'm an alumni now, so that's exciting. Um, as far as the switch from normal class to kind of the pandemic it was very different not going back to class after spring break but most of my professors did a fantastic job of kind of making that switch and making the online learning environment still important to me as far as my future plans go i am actually in the car right now on my way to visit harrisburg pennsylvania where i will be moving to work as a rotational industrial engineer um, with PE connectivity. Um, so I will be working in some of their manufacturing facilities, getting to move around and see different job functions as a part of their rotational engineering program for the first two years. So overall, I'm super thankful for all of my time at NC State and especially all that they did in this last semester to kind of adjust and make learning still possible for us. 
Thank you, Meredith. Um, I don't know did, if either one of you attended our virtual celebration for students recently. Um, as, as many people yeah. know, we were not able to have a, a physical graduation ceremony. Did you or your family members attend? Yes. I did. Um, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, I did attend. I did all of, all of my family. And it was really nice to see like everybody virtually graduate. But yeah. Yes. I attended as well. And if anything, I'm excited to have an excuse to come back if we do something in person later. So that's definitely something to look forward to as well. Great, perfect. We'll take you up on that, Meredith. Normally our spring graduation <laughs> would have up to about a thousand people uh, in the room, uh, including the graduates and their family and friends. And we just couldn't do that right now, both with the governor's orders and, and with uh, what that might mean for infections. So we had a, a virtual celebration that Rob Lassen and others put together where we um, had some information about each of the students to celebrate them, but we will invite you back for a physical ceremony. So <laughs> you will get to come Sounds back great. and we do hope to see you. Does anybody have any um, questions for the students? And we'll, we'll ask the students to hang on longer as well. So you can come back and, and ask them at the end if you need to. Okay, so we'll ask the students to go on mute for now and, and hang out with us, uh, and we'll go to the next portion. Um, there are a number of different alumni who have, um, oops, excuse me, I'll get to that one in a moment, uh, who have been participating in the COVID response, and we've got two of them to here today with us to talk. And in addition, you can see in that middle section there that uh, Natalia Somerville has been working with SAS and, and very active there on the core team to help uh, combat the coronavirus. And then the next slide, I will turn it over to Debbie for a few minutes. And um, I have some pictures that I'll share with you um, as Debbie talks. But um, Debbie, if you can come off mute and talk for us, that'd be great. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? <clears throat> okay, good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Debbie Beaker, a 1985 graduate from the industrial engineering program, and I started with Thomasville Furniture right out of college. Um, Rick Coffey and I crossed paths through those years. Um, so uh, I'm a resident of Davidson County still, but working at Baker Furniture up here in uh, the Burke County area. So the whole COVID-19 thing, as it's hit all of us, but I have, <clears throat> I feel like it bombarded me all at one point in time, but not from a sickness point of view. Um, just from the fact that I had been traveling in Asia to the Philippines in uh, late January. Uh, so heard a lot about it, saw the masks. I got the flu in the middle of February. It was diagnosed as type A flu, but of course there were signs on the doors and put a mask on my face. And it's interesting, they didn't ask me a lot of questions. They just said, have you traveled internationally? I uh, told them about it and sort of just went on. So it's amazing how time changes just since a few, few months ago. Uh, and then in March, um, my son, who's a college senior at Swarthmore College up near Philadelphia, playing baseball down in Florida for their spring break, right in the middle of that, it came to a screeching halt because of the, as you just described, the, the college effect and closings and sports. And so just a whirlwind early March February, January for me, it all tied together. So on our trip back from Florida, um, I was feverishly typing up protocol for our plants to follow since this had become such a, a, a point in time during that week of March 9th through the uh, 14th. So I sort of became the, the COVID-19 czar for our plant. And we um, immediately, Mike Jolly, our president, who's also a state graduate, he showed me a, a YouTube video one day, just you know, in the middle of March, he says, I think, I think we got to get this going. He said, this thing is um, really headed in that direction. So we started tinkering with the mask. We contacted the Blue Ridge Healthcare System, which is a hospital in Morganton. And um, one a person from their infectious disease control actually came to the plant, saw what we were making. We tweaked the design and uh, kind of got off the ground just working with um, some of our excess fabric, limited fabric, fabric we were discontinuing. And we got this going at both our facilities, one in Hildebrand and High Point. So we started, uh, this was mid-March through the end of March. This was before the stay at home order kicked in. 
we were making masks for our employees, for the families, and for really just any word of mouth um, amongst our employees, like they maybe had a spouse that worked at a, a clinic or a dermatology clinic or a dentist's office or daycare. And we just started producing them and passing them out in the community, which was very rewarding. Um, it enabled us to keep our sewers and cutters going because we, once the end of March came around with the stay at home order, being a residential producer, we were not deemed essential. So we did um, put many of our employees on a temporary layoff, furlough, whatever the correct word is you wanna call it, but we were able to keep, keep going. So produced some of these photos here, we gave them out to restaurants, hospitals, um, like I said, High Point family, in a High Point area hospice, High Point family practice. That photo in the top left corner was actually a mask giveaway we had at the factory. We had a drive-by mask giveaway to our employees um, that were on temporary layoff and said, please just drive by, roll down your window, we will hand you masks for you to use with your family. So hopefully um, spreading that word, that intelligence about this whole problem and getting them to um, follow the social distancing and all the proper procedures when they're at home as well. Um, hardware store, daycare, and the bottom right photo is actually the Randolph County school system, the, the lunch um, program, passing out lunches. Um, so they're wearing our masks. So we've got them distributed all over the Guilford County, Davidson County area, um, Burke County, Catawba County area, just like I said, word of mouth, anyone that wanted them. Then the next step, we got in cahoots with the uh, Carolina Textile District, Industrial Commons, which is the organization that pulled together a lot of manufacturers that had capabilities. And so we've become a member of that with the efforts of making a standardized pedestrian mask that um, many manufacturers are supporting. And so they're doing the distribution. We do the labor, the sewing, and um, provide back to them and they're handling the distribution as orders come in. So that's been another very, very rewarding angle in all this. Um, we, we plan to continue. Now this is the first week back that we have brought all our folks back from the stay home order. All of our plant folks are not back yet. We're kind of um, phasing that back as we get our production back uh, on track. Um, we did have some permanent layoffs during this time period as well. So we're kind of adjusting back to the new level and our backlog right now. So we're, we're still making masks full steam for ourselves. And I feel like we're gonna get back into the, the cohort with uh, Carolina Textile District kind of in a full steam too, once we balance out. But um, just very rewarding, our employees have embraced not only the manufacturing, but the understanding of how important it is. Back probably three or four weeks ago now, we started requiring all employees to wear masks. So social distancing, the sanitizing, all the basic concepts that they told us in that first week of March on spring break when we heard all those things, um, they all hold true now. There's hardly been anything any different um, taking place other than the more mandatory mask wearing. So we're doing that here, making our own. We bought some other, uh, the surgical type, you know, that um, not really surgical, but similar along those lines that are lighter weight for the employees, but taking the temperatures in the morning and um, just, just trying to do all the right things and instilling in them how they should act also outside of um, the business world. But it's been a tremendous, you know, you should try to look at the positives in all this. It's been a tremendous um, rallying point in a, in a terrible situation is just getting everybody to come on board and march in lockstep to do the right thing. So a lot of, a lot of pride in a, in a tough, tough time. It's amazing because you know, you and your, your workers, there's no doubt in my mind that they're helping to save lives, that, that this can be one of the reasons that the transmission rate in this area could be lower because um, you know, the science does show if that, you know, if we really had a significant, percentage of the population wearing masks a significant period of time that it you know the epidemic would would drop away if that really were happening and when you talk about people in these essential industries like restaurants where they're interacting with people every single day and healthcare workers who are at greater risk that's really amazing 
and your employees should should feel very proud about it. Yeah, it's um, it's really rewarding when you go around and you try to really take a glant gander at folks and see if they're wearing their mask. It's amazing. They could they could cheat. They could pull it down. They could you know be breathing, but it seems like everybody's just really embraced the concept. And so, like you say, hopefully they're carrying it out into their personal lives and and setting the example because there's plenty of others out there uh, in public that are not abiding by the the agreed upon rules and the suggested rules. So yeah, you're right in that. Heart that education component that you have been providing to your employees and to the community is also very helpful. I know that masks have become controversial for some. I think, you know, maybe they are part of the target of the, you know, the anxiety and the rage that, that people feel. Um, but, you know, we, we do know that if I wear a mask, I help protect you. If you wear a mask, you help protect me. And if we're all wearing them, then, you know, then we'll be better off in that system. Any questions for, for Debbie? You want to tell us about any more of the pictures that, that I might not have hit on at the right time? You told us about some of them. Who's this group in the bottom right right here? Bottom right, I believe, was uh, High Point Guilford County Area Clinic. Maybe that's the uh, Central Carolina Dermatology Clinic, possibly, or the Surgery Center. Um, some of those went to High Point. The upper right is the uh, hospital in Morganton that I mentioned where we started at the Blue Ridge Healthcare mm -hmm. Hospital Fantastic. there. That's and then there's your facility, of course, and your packaging mask getting ready to go out the door, right? Yeah, actually the packaging and the FedExing, we sent packages of masks to all of our sales reps, mm. showrooms across the country as well, so that we would make sure our, the extended Baker family um, yeah outside of here was, was equipped sure. and, and here yeah. as well. That's great. Okay, then we're going to, to go to our next alumni speaker. And we've got Rick Coffey here from uh, McCrary Modern, uh, an, an FMM grad from 1978. And we have a few pictures from, from him as well, but I'd like to turn it over to Rick for a little bit. Okay. Well, I uh, want to start out and say this is probably the digital or uh, Zoom version of what we used to call the hot press. Uh, some of y'all, uh, the old alumni will remember that was our newsletter that we used to publish uh, a couple of times a year and send out to all the old FMM graduates. And unfortunately, I was one of the editors uh, of the hot press during my time there. But, uh, uh, Rick, if you have any old copies of that, I'm, I'm sure Rob could find a way to use it. I tried to find some. I do have them. I just uh, didn't have them here at work. I actually was going to try and flash one, but uh, I came up short. I think uh, Gene was involved, uh, along with my brother, uh, initiating the hot press uh, uh, back uh, early in 70, possibly 71. I think that was right, Rick. It was right around uh, actually 71 or 72, probably. And uh, yes, Rick's brother Gary was involved, and Ken Burns, I think, came up with the name for the hot press. <laughs> So for those of you who are not in the furniture industry, that uh, was a very important piece of equipment in uh, laminating uh, tabletops and uh, end panels, uh, floor fronts, and those types of things. Uh, so it, uh, it meant a lot to the furniture graduates. Right. I thought I'd start out with uh, really just talking a little bit about McCreary Modern and letting you understand uh, who we are as a company. Uh, we are a family, uh, an employee-owned business. We are an ESOP. Our employees own 30% of the company. Uh, we've been around 34 years. Uh, we're quite unique in the industry. We are uh, vertically integrated. Uh, we source virtually all of our materials locally. Uh, and uh, like Julie said, I'm a 78 graduate and I've been with McCrary Modern now for 21 years and I'm the president and chief operating officer. Uh, we're a very communi uh, community focused uh, organization and our executive staff, uh, we serve on several boards. I personally uh, served on UNC Healthcare Board for eight years, and I was chairman of the board at UNC Healthcare for two years. Also uh, served on the board of UNC Caldwell Hospital Foundation. I was the chairman there also. Uh, served on the Caldwell Community College and Technical Institute Foundation Board, and also the Catawba County K-64 Board, among others. So uh, I, uh, this has given me a lot of experience uh, and uh, a unique perspective on both healthcare and education uh, locally here. Uh, we 
looking at producing masks early on. Uh, we were looking at uh, not only designs, but materials. And a lot of people were talking about using 100% cotton and some other things. And then, you know, being the engineer that I am, uh, we started uh, just dissecting how they were made, what materials were involved in it. And uh, by mid-March, Hospice of Catawba County had reached out to us and they were literally in tears. They, uh, they needed masks. Um, for their staff, for patients and visitors. Uh, they were uh, at a point where they couldn't let people visit. Uh, you know, people that were going through the final stages of their life and it just tore our hearts out, to be honest with you. So uh, I had been researching the possibility of making masks. Uh, I had reached out to our state senator, uh, Mark Meadows, who had visited our facility, and Congressman McHenry, who had also visited our operations. Uh, sent letters to FEMA, uh, Medical Mask of America, Carolina Textile District. Uh, and to be honest with you, everything was moving so quickly that uh, I received little or no feedback from any of these organizations due to the crisis at hand. This was very early on in the pandemic. Uh, the other thing we had done uh, from an organization standpoint is even as early as late January, I had uh, told our organization everything that we import uh, from China, I wanted us to secure two to three months supply of materials on that before uh, really anybody uh, realized how bad it was going to be. I sort of thought this thing could get real bad and get real bad real fast for our organization. So we are very fortunate that we can uh, do that type of thing. And uh, uh, so we, uh, we did secure that to allow ourselves to continue to operate. Uh, how However, during my research, I was able to source uh, actually a dissection and construction of uh, the materials used in a typical what's called an FFP2 mask, which is a mask version of a N95. Uh, it's a class two surgical mask. Uh, our material supplier of non-wovens uh, confirmed that uh, the spun bond materials we sourced uh, to use in some of our products was extremely close in weight and properties to the materials that are used in mass manufacture. Uh, as a matter of fact, this supplier serviced uh, the domestic mask manufacturing in our region. And really more importantly, uh, we had a substantial supply of a, a key water barrier material that's uh, uh, called a, a spun bond melt bloom spun bond laminate. It's, a, it's a, uh, used in our um, ticking and our outdoor products that we manufacture. Uh, they're heat sealed. Uh, we use them in our cushions and backs and throws and all of our outdoor products that we manufacture. It, it prohibits the water droplets from entering and exiting the wearer. Uh, so uh, we uh, made the decision uh, to utilize the resources we had. We really wanted to make the best mask we possibly could and pivoted the business uh, to the production of uh, masks. You know, I, I love cliches and uh, one of my favorite is uh, sometimes you just do what's right and ask for forgiveness later. Uh, and that's really what we did because we went into this mass manufacturing not knowing what the legal implications were, not knowing if, uh, you know, what the liabilities were for the organization. We just knew it was the right thing to do and it was the right thing to do for our community. And, uh, you know, we're just ex blessed with exceptional leadership in our operations. Our CAD team was able to quickly digitize uh, an exceptional design. Uh, we used our automated electric cutters to cut thousands of mass components. Uh, but there were two key elements in making mass that uh, we had to determine how to source and create. Uh, one was the metal bridge insert that, uh, that goes in the mass to actually form it to the nose. Uh, and so uh, our plant manager uh, over our consolidated cut and sew facility, Kathy uh, Farley determined, and this I thought was just amazing, that a little pipe cleaner, and for the students, you probably don't know what a pipe cleaner is. <laughs> so that's what one looks like, a little fuzzy uh, around a metal, a little uh, metal stake. Uh, and she determined that we could cut those to size, we could implant them into the uh, bridge area, and it would form fit perfectly. Uh, so uh, we were then uh, sort of off to the races. Uh, we wanted to, uh, it became a, a quest, I would say, to purchase every pipe cleaner we could possibly find in three counties. Uh, my wife, 
personally took this on as a, as a mission and she uh, bought out every pipe cleaner she could find uh, in Alexander and Caldwell County. And then we had other people buying them all out in, in, in Catawba County. Uh, the other challenge, the second challenge we had was sourcing the elastic ear loops. Uh, we had some stretch elastic, but it was way too wide uh, to use as ear loops. And so we began slitting uh, what we had into three eight inch wide strips uh, to create ear loops. Uh, we then got on the phone, called our suppliers uh, who were closed and said, I need you to reopen. We're going to buy all the elastic that you guys have, all the stretch elastic that you have. Well, you know, being myself, I also said, you know, if you want to donate it, I'll take it. Uh, and they did. They were happy to do that. So people like Interstate Foam, United Sewing Machine, Atlantic Products, and others helped uh, contribute, contribute to our product. You know, it's truly amazing what a, uh, what a can do and we can overcome any obstacle attitude and work ethic uh, can accomplish. Uh, our response, uh, from a request for uh, information. Uh, actually, we did receive, finally receive something from Congressman McHenry, and he specifically addressed PPE manufacturing and how the FDA allows manufacturing and distribution of masks as long as they're classified as a class two surgical mask. And there's seven specific limitations, uh, including uh, property labeling those masks. Fortunately, you know, we've been able to donate thousands of masks to hospice, first responders, uh, assisted living here, uh, Abernathy Laurels here locally. Uh, and to validate the effectiveness of our mask, uh, you know, I'm an engineer through, through and through. So we, I wanted to see the breathability, the poricity of the, of the mask. I wanted to make sure it was uh, adequate for people that we were supplying them to. So we sent those, uh, gave them to the Manufacturing Solutions Center here in Conover. They actually tested them in less than 24 hours, and they confirmed, uh, confirmed that the breathability that we had was the same as a 3M N95 mask. So we, we knew that at least our people would, uh, and the people that we were providing these masks for, uh, you know, could breathe at least as easily as if they had a, a full N95 mask. Uh, McCreary Modern decided to shut down for two weeks beginning the first and second week in April. Really, we determined it was our best interest to uh, pay our employee owners 40 hours regular pay during both of these shutdown weeks. Uh, we're a very conservative organization. Uh, we've accumulated a war chest over the years in case we uh, had a catastrophic issue that we had to deal with. And this allowed us to provide the funds uh, to our employees. Uh, this was no part of any PPP program. We did this on our own. We did it because it's the right thing to do and the way We'd like to trade our people. Uh, it cost us about $1.8 million to provide payroll for two solid weeks to our employees. Uh, during this time, uh, we asked for paid volunteers to come back uh, to make masks while we were shut down. And two of our th three sewing operations responded with individuals along with managers that provided uh, desperately needed masks for the community. And it became part of our reopening strategy. And, and Prairie Modern was, uh, Matter of fact, the first day was listed as an essential business because we were producing masks uh, and distributing them. Uh, so by about March the 27th, we were supplying over 3,000 masks a week to UNC Healthcare. Uh, they also uh, were involved in testing our product. Uh, and we continue to deliver those at 3,000 a week. Uh, and so far, we've delivered about 27,000 masks to UNC Healthcare. Uh, we delivered 8,000 masks to Teleos. That is a uh, consortium of hospices in Western North Carolina. Uh, and and we've, since then, we've given them an additional 2,000. Um, you know, one of the more challenging aspects of making masks uh, and donating them is determining who receives them. Uh, Prairie Modern early on defined, uh, decided that we were going to uh, support nonprofits that were at risk uh, in the local hospitals and they really should be our focus. Uh, this creates, unfortunately, a lot of tenacious telephone calls and conversations uh, when people are calling you asking for masks. Uh, but I can't list all the groups that we've been able to, uh, been able to provide masks for, everything from little volunteer fire departments uh, who refuse to not bring donuts for over a thousand people, 
to repay us for that uh, gesture and the it's just been a humbling experience to say the very least um, simultaneously and, uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Debbie can uh, appreciate it you know we're we're trying to keep the business running so we're uh, trying to get McCrary Modern listed as an essential business. We're communicating to our employee owners, uh, our return to work status. Uh, we're supplying them paperwork for critical industry employee authorizations to be able to travel to work. We're creating best practices. Uh, and uh, I have to say, we actually created the best practices before CDC put theirs out for return to work. And darn it, they weren't about the same. So I thought I might send them a little plagiarism thing. Uh, the guidelines uh, for daily temperature monitoring, wearing of masks, uh, social distancing, sanitation for our facilities, uh, and communicating this through Facebook and our webpage. And my advice to anybody is do not use Facebook as a way to communicate to your people. Uh, it's very testing uh, experience uh, because of the amount of feedback that you sometimes get when they don't read the document completely that you provide them on some of the policies, procedures, and protocols that we've put in place. Uh, currently, we've been back to work for five weeks. Uh, we're running a limited four-day work schedule. Uh, our, uh, we're compensating all of our employees for 40 hours. If they work 24 hours, 36 hours, or whatever, we're paying 40 hours work for everybody that's worked here. That's worked here. We want to make sure that we uh, help them any way we possibly can during uh, this crisis. If anyone does not feel comfortable uh, and does not want to work, uh, we're paying for their insurance and for their uh, supplementary insurance uh, to take care of them and, until they uh, feel comfortable to return to work. Uh, we've produced and distributed at this point in time a, a little over 70,000 masks. Uh, we've absorbed virtually all the cost. I mean, it's really our way of making a difference during this most trying time. So now as you can see, we're, uh, it's been one of the most stressful, uh, challenging, but rewarding experiences in my life. Uh, you know, my education at State really reinforced, reinforced the belief that uh, uh, State uses a little different motto now, but right back then we used to say, uh, uh, you know, define the problem, analyze the problem, resolve the problem. And, uh, you know, there are people that run towards the fire and there are those that watch. And, State teaches us really to attack the fire. Uh, and as Jim Valvano said, I gotta, I gotta put a plug in for Jim. You know, just never give up. Uh, don't ever let people uh, tell you you can't do something, uh, do what's right. Uh, you know, and I really appreciate your time and attention today. Uh, it's, it's been a really gratifying experience for me. And it's so important for the, for the communities around you, um, you know, those, those masks that you've delivered. I'll, I'll show a couple more of your pictures, although I don't think that we have the, um, the distribution of them. We have more of the production side where your employees are making them. And I'm sure that they are also so proud of, of what they've been able to do. And, you know, I hope you're flooded with applications to work there uh, after all of this. Well, somebody, somebody I, I read, either read or heard, Julian said that uh, how you treat your people during this time period will define your business, whether you survive or not. So mm -hmm. we try to treat our people as best we possibly can afford to do under the circumstances that we deal with. Yeah, and, and that's great. And I and I also do love the the little engineering pieces to the story you told, where uh, you know you you checked out the properties and. You know, and, and the work that you did on your supply chain, even for your regular supply chain, where you procured those materials before they ran out as you saw the pandemic coming, you know, that's a, a classic, uh, you know, engineering kind of thing. You, you see this disruption, you, you plan ahead and, and do what you can. And, you know, the, the most advanced companies in the world are, are doing that. Apple does that after the, the earthquake in Japan. And, you know, the, your relationships with suppliers that you talked about, that's also critical to being able to put together operations like these, um, where you've built up those relationships over a, a long period of time, I imagine. Yeah, and, and just like Debbie, we've sent masks to uh, some of our uh, customers so that they can open their product, uh, their, their uh, showrooms back up, deliver product, and also, uh, 
you know, for the truck drivers, warehousing people, and those kind of things. And it's it's uh, it's been really gratifying because uh, I'd send samples out and and they would say, you know, your masks are what we would call industrial quality. They last for a long time. I said they really are. They're because of the properties and it's triple. Uh, yeah. It's three layers put together along with the all of it uh, non-woven. They're cleanable. All you have to yeah. do is burst them in peroxide or alcohol air dry them and they're ready to go again. So we've actually uh, issued masks to our employees every single week, a new mask every week, and we ask them to rotate those every two to three days. And that way uh, uh, they uh, sanitize themselves over a period of time uh, because of the uh, properties and materials that we're using in these. So uh, I, I told people I've had to almost become a uh, expert in mask manufacturing, but uh, as you can kind of tell, we, we really, sort of micromanage our business and if we're going to do something, we're going to do it right. We're not going to, we're not going to jump into something and do it halfway. Yeah. Well, and this non-woven that you're talking about, it's really a specialized material. It's not made and it's not, it's not woven, it's blown, you know, so you can think of something like cotton candy where they're, yes. they're blowing that sugar into a pattern. And because of both the, size and, and structure of it. And also I think um, the electrical charge that exists in some of the materials, that's what is filtering the virus particles so they can't get through. Now, yeah. even a mask without that can block a lot of the, the bigger particles, but, yeah. but that certainly has the ability to, to block things. And there are limited manufacturers of that worldwide. So that has been a, a real critical part of the, the shortages that, that we've seen. Yeah, and we're we're faced with uh, eventually running out of this material because you can't secure any more of it, as you That's well right. know. And, uh, That's right. So there's some alternate materials we may look at uh, uh, to substitute. We were just so blessed that we had an ample supply of this uh, particular material. And yeah. then uh, one of our sources uh, was able to supply us with uh, several rolls. And, you know, the nice thing about a mask, it's very small, so you can produce you know, tens of thousands off of one roll of material. Mm -hmm. Our College of Textiles has a non-wovens institute at uh, NC State, and they also have been producing and, and ramping up uh, their production of that material. So um, I know that they're, you know, I think they're working with uh, a large manufacturer and distributor, but um, I'm, I'm on the lookout too to see if there's anything they can do for the, the industries here in North Carolina. North Carolina has actually had um, a, a lower rate of uh, COVID-19 cases than some of the states. I've, I've looked at the data quite a lot um, for my, my own uh, research interest as well as um, from the standpoint of NC State. And, and maybe the masks that, that uh, Baker and McCrary are putting out there are one of the reasons for it. Um, you know, that you've really been distributing them widely, thousands and thousands of, of masks. And we're very fortunate to have the furniture industry here, the textile industry here, and, and have components that could really scale up and, and owners who could uh, innovate and, and make that happen. Are there any questions for, uh, for Rick uh, about Macquarie Modern? And, and we'll also open it up to additional questions for Debbie from Baker as well. Any questions? How have you guys been handling the uh, social distancing as you bring people back to work? Gene, for us, it was pretty easy because of the way our manufacturing process is. You know, uh, pollsters are 10 to 15 feet apart in our work stations uh, to begin with. Our sewers were already separated uh, at least six to eight feet, even on our automated uh, dispatch and delivery systems. Um, we only had just a few areas, and of course, by requiring everybody to wear a mask, uh, it, it allowed us to uh, uh, take temperatures, make sure that uh, you know that they felt secure when they came in here. The biggest areas that we had to kind of block off were the uh, uh, social areas where in the break rooms. We what we we did was uh, x off and uh, uh, used yellow tape to force them to sit in every other seat. And then the same thing, and uh, unfortunately in the smoking areas, which uh, we still provide for our people, uh, that uh, they want to congregate in those two. So you had to pull the picnic tables apart, you know, and put X's to where they could sit and where they couldn't sit. So uh, make sure they continued the social 
distance. Those are two toughest areas were just the social areas during breaks that, uh, where they congregate so many times. Debbie? Yeah, very similar from Baker. Um, I think I think the main thing now we have a trouble with now that everyone is wearing the mask and very familiar with that. The time we see people get close together is when they're carrying on conversations because they can't read each other's lips. They can't hear very well. So we're, we're trying to break that or, or an awareness of that. It's like, watch out. You got to keep your distance um, during conversations, not only just during the, the work time, but that's just because people can't hear so that that's something we're trying to trying to work through but like rick said the nature of the placement of folks in the finishing room um mach machine room upholstery we kind of naturally had had space but we also um staggered breaks and lunches just to divide people up into smaller groups there as well so implemented that to, to help make smaller smaller groups and, and these are things that the university is also thinking quite a lot about. We have over 30,000 students and thousands of employees. And if you think about a classroom full of people, you think about entry and exit doors of a busy building, it's really hard. I mean, we, we won't be able to, to distance people six feet apart. So we're, we're looking at a whole lot of different solutions before August runs around. Um, so, you know, in, in different, you know, different industries have different structures so other industries are also doing that other questions yes uh debbie and rick this is mike walsh with the ic department first of all thank you so much for the great work you're doing and for um you know just discussing you know what your companies are doing today um how long do you foresee the actual manufacturing of masks going forward is it just until you run out of material or will this now become a a new, a new uh, uh, addition to your product line, um, you know, because I think lots of things are obviously going to change for this country and this globe uh, once we can get a handle on this thing. Uh, as far as I'll jump in with Baker real quick. I mean, we've been making masks full steam with all our, well, most all of our sewers for the past um, six to seven weeks. But like I said, now that we're we kind of geared back up regular production, we're trying to evaluate. Um, you know, our backlog, phasing back in our employees that were temporarily laid off, kind of getting back up to, up to speed. So we've, we've slowed down the amount of manpower we put toward making the masks, but we know it's going to be a, a continual um, ongoing thing for quite a period of time. So still leaving that door open definitely to continue making. It's just a matter of we'll work through the mechanics of, of requests and you know, every time we get a request, we, like Rick said, you tears, tears at your heartstrings. You can't not fulfill a request. Um, got one the other day, a hey, organization asked for 50 masks. Ladies jumped in and had them done like within an hour and back on production. So it, it's amazing the, the turnaround and the excitement and all this. So yeah, to answer your question, we will continue. It's just gonna be a modified peaks and valleys time in terms of uh, the attention we put on it. Yeah, the same thing for us. We're unfortunately we're running to the end of some of our math, uh, material that we have. Uh, we estimate we could probably make about eighty thousand. So I probably have got about a two week supply, we're making about five thousand a week now. We are uh, basically assigning about uh, ten sewers in two different locations and some support people uh, to make masks. But we're also building furniture, obviously uh, as, as we go along here. At the same time. Uh, We'll have to make a determination if we want to change the materials and, and continue to make those. As long as there is a need, we'll probably continue to do that. Uh, it's not a core competency for us as a company. And I'm, I'll be you know, the first to say I'm embarrassed at what it cost us to make one of these things. Uh, and, you know, I actually ran a cost sheet on it, and we, these, these masks cost us between $5.50 and $6 a piece to make. So we've given away over $400,000. In mask. Uh, if you look at people that do this for a living, it's it's an automated process with heat sealing. It, you know, it, it's uh, there's equipment and uh, uh, that do this completely seamlessly without any people whatsoever. Uh, so I don't personally see us as, as getting into this business. We just did it because it was just uh, such a great need. Uh, for our community at this point in time. And, uh, uh, 
that was one of the reasons we decided just to, to uh, give them away. I, when I started running cost analysis on them, I went, I'm embarrassed, but you know, it cost us this much to produce these things. There's, there's just no way I can charge for them, period. I think it was, you know, we never even really thought about that, but it was really sort of a humbling experience to go, it, it's, all, it's all labor. Uh, you know, you got 31 cent worth of materials in it, but it's all hand done. Everything's hand sewn, double stitched, inserted, inverted. Uh, you got people, you know, slitting the elastic and cutting uh, these little uh, pipe cleaners to size. So it's, it's not an inexpensive way to, to, to produce the product. Uh, so it, it's something that we probably, long term, we, it won't be part of our core competency. Great. Thank you both. Great question, Mike. Any other questions? Well, well, let me just um, uh, uh, echo the. Hello. Oh yeah, Hello. sorry. Yeah. There we go. Uh, this is this is Larry. Uh, just uh, you know, I'll just maybe prompt you or ask in the form of question, but uh, just some big picture things for the department uh, about you know, like our graduates. How many how many uh, were scheduled to get uh, to graduate, and then. Uh, the building, I think, uh, you know, we've talked about that some, but the move to the building has been pushed out and, um, and, you know, things like that incoming class, any, you know, just kind of general information about the department that I'm interested in getting an update on. Maybe some of the others would like to hear it too. Great question, Larry. Thank you. I, I will take that. Um, we have generally in the spring, we have over a hundred graduates. So I, I don't know exactly what that number was. Um, you know, typically it's about 70 to 80 undergraduates plus master's students and PhD students. And of course, you know, they couldn't be there in person with us and, and we couldn't be there in person with them. And so that was, that was sad, but um, we will still stay connected and, and find ways to engage with them uh, at a later time for that graduation. Um, universities across the nation are facing some real challenges for the coming fall as, um, as two things happen. Um, one is that uh, right now international students are not able to come to the United States and, and they are often in graduate programs, masters and PhD programs. We do also have domestic students, but there are not as many who want to pursue that path. Um, and so universities across the nation normally depend on those those dollars associated with those students to help support all of the operations of the university. Um, the projections are, you know, for, for in general in, in science and engineering, that the drop of enrollment of graduate students could be 60% down, 70% down of new enrolling students. And that just has significant ramifications. The university, uh, NC State is doing things to try to address that. We're letting in more students in, in fields where they do have a larger demand um, from domestic students that are not as disrupted by the, by the pandemic. Um, we're trying to defer some of the admissions. And then even on the undergraduate side, even our domestic students, because this is happening to all kinds of different universities from NC State to UNC Chapel Hill to Purdue in Indiana to Cornell in New York, as they all experience their anticipated drops, they're going further into their wait list and admitting more students. So then you have a student who didn't get in initially to Purdue or Cornell who are being admitted, and they may have told another college that they were going there, but now they, they may go to this other one that, that might be more preferred for them. So this is happening nationwide. Uh, NC State is also going into its wait list, anticipating lower numbers in the fall. Uh, to, uh, to, you know, because we have a lot of fixed costs associated with our buildings, our faculty, our staff, our, our dorms, our parking debts, all of these things that are built on a structure of 30,000 students or more. Uh, we're trying to do so in ways that do not change the quality of the class, but, you know, certainly there's some programs where, where we can do that. Um, and I think that, that Research One universities like NC State will have an easier time of this than some universities do. Um, but this will cause significant problems uh, throughout the nation. Um, but we are right now engineering at the undergraduate level. It looks like it's currently on track for enrollment for the fall. You know, and they're trying to predict it, but it's very uncertain. Uh, at the graduate level, we, we will have a reduction and we hope to, to get that up uh, eventually. 
um, and, and we'll see what happens there. Fitzwillard Hall, the construction of the building has continued. The construction itself, uh, construction is considered an essential business, so that continued. As far as I know, there were no known cases of COVID-19 among the construction workers. And, you know, a lot of times they're separated from each other and they may be wearing masks anyway because of uh, the respiration around paint and fumes and dust and those kinds of things. Um, but there are some other delays that have occurred in the building with the HVAC system, with the communications network. And the Dean was also worried about um, opening the new building up that has a lot of classrooms for students, but it, it expects to have a large flow of students every day. So 1500 students or more coming in and out every day, coming back and forth to classes and transitioning. And so there's some real concerns or questions there about making sure that we can protect the health of our students, our faculty and staff. And so for the moment, we don't know exactly when we'll move into Fitzwillard Hall. We're waiting to find out. Um, my current best guess right now is that we might uh, have that, that possibility in September, but it would be very disruptive in the middle of the semester. So we would probably only move limited operations in the middle of the semester and, and then do some at a, at a later point in time. Uh, the university is looking at what it will do across a whole range of things, you know, housing, dorms, you could imagine would be another hot spot of potential contagion where people are living in close quarters. I'm expecting that there'll be policies or plans in place to reduce the occupancy of dorms, um, you know, knowing that, of course, students also live in apartments uh, around the campus, uh, and there are a number of new apartment buildings that have happened in the last uh, couple of years. Um, we're looking at dining facilities and how best to feed 30,000 students, you know, for lunch every day across these different facilities um, uh, and, you know, just across the whole spread of things. Sports is another one, you know, universities across the nation do also depend on the revenue associated with football and basketball to help support their overall operation. And the chancellor has stated that, you know, they've already sold season tickets for these things. But you know, from looking at major sports that, uh, you know, certainly some are making the decision to, to play, but not in front of fans. I don't know what's being decided there, but I do know that the university is looking at it and wants to do what's right for the students when, and then what's also right for the, the larger community. So are, are doing what they can there. Uh, and of course, we want to continue to support students in their, in their pathways towards uh, graduation and jobs. Uh, we have seen some internships for students get canceled for this summer uh, as companies decided not to take additional people into their workforce. Uh, so we have a, a larger enrollment in the summer classes at NC State this summer. Uh, we also had study abroad experiences canceled because students were not able to travel and, and faculty with them to these different countries around the world. So that also led to more students being here in the summer. There's also been a question of whether uh, COVID-19 would have an impact on full-time employment for those who are graduating like England and, and Meredith. It sounds like both of them are on track to start their job on time. There are some that I think that jobs have had a delayed start, but so far I've not heard major reports of, um, of, of cancellation of full-time offers and, and things like that. Um, we are continuing to watch for that and, and providing some advice to our, our students in, in these troubling times. Um, we have an alumni, Patrick Murray, who recently told a story of uh, getting a job offer during the time of the 1987 crash of the stock market. So, you know, the, it took him longer to find a job, but he eventually ended up at Intel where he had a, a wonderful career there. Um, and we are, you know, trying to make sure that our, our students um, have skill sets that will be very valuable in the workplace. We did uh, recently get approval to add uh, or change the name of a degree from what was a supply chain engineering management degree to a master's in engineering management. So we will be able to open up that in the future, which is joint between the College of Engineering and the College of Management. And that may be attractive to uh, to others, including alumni who might uh, be interested in changing careers or, or might have reduced employment uh, as we move forward. So that's a little bit of an update on, on what's going on as, uh, at the university as we move forward and, and see what the next phase looks like. 
We do have a, I meant to put it on the slide, I can send it to you later. We do have a way that people can contribute to students. Um, you know, we are prioritizing any donations to the university to support students. So far that fund has raised more than a million dollars, which sounds like a lot, but when you think about the number of students that we have, it, it really, there's still the demand far outstrips the supply. Um, so I, I think that they're giving out something like $25,000 a, a day on average uh, as the burn rate uh, for students who need a little bit of assistance because many student workers are not able to, uh, you know, to have their usual job. The university did pay for um, extended paid administrative leave, both for students and staff who were not able to work remotely in ways that they normally would have done. But even so, I'm sure that there are reduced opportunities for a number of students, both on campus and off campus. Great question, Larry. Anything else? I, I also want to thank uh, Jean for uh, helping organize this event today and, and putting it together uh, and you know, working with Mike and, and Rob on making it happen. And uh, I, I thank the students, England uh, and Meredith, who were able to join us today. And I thank uh, uh, our alumni today who were able to tell these great stories and, and they and their companies are really, you know, saving lives with uh, sewing machines and fabric. And I, I really do believe that. And I, I know that um, the employees are very proud of, of that as well. Uh, and with that, I will just say, uh, go pack and, you know, hopefully everybody else uh, does too. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There's the picture. Excellent. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you, Dr. Long.